the way I look at it is investing is really simple. Taxes are very complex. Taxes are where you want a professional. You with me on that, Bray? Absolutely. I love a CPA, a really good CPA who can help with taxes. Yeah. CPAs often will help with your tax filing. May not do long-term tax planning because they're trying to make the goal, how do I pay less money this year? Whereas financial planners, we're trying to make sure you're paying less money over your entire lifetime. There are sometimes with a CPA, I'll argue, I'm like, yes, I know that's the right answer this year. It's the wrong answer long-term. Uh, where if you're optimizing to pay the least taxes this year, you may end up paying more in the future. Got to find a balance between it. So that's the tax section. I'm not going to ask you how you rated it because it sounded like you loved it. But, uh, you know. Yeah, it was, it was a good time. Welcome to the Child Free Wealth Podcast, hosted by Bree and Dr. J, Certified Financial Planner. Here we discuss life and finances as it relates to being child free. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Please consult your advisor before implementing any ideas heard on this podcast. Hey, Child Free Wealth listeners, we are back talking about what a CFP learns. And we are talking about one of the most fun, no, I don't know, the one of the oddest topics. It's it's actually April 15th when we're recording this, and it makes sense because we're talking about tax planning. We're going to talk about taxes. I'm just getting out of tax season. Like Clients send us their stuff. I've had enough taxes, but this happened to be the day to record the tax section. Uh, so we're going to talk about what a CFP learns on the tax side. We're going to talk about how these things change the child-free person. But before we go there, since Bree just went through all this, I'm going to ask her a question. because I'm recording another podcast after this. And one of the questions they put in the interview was, okay, what withholding should a child-free person put on their taxes? Well, are you single or married? I put zero. Okay. And by the way, it's the Claiming Zero podcast. So like, you know, they kind of set me up for the question, but we'll come back to it because in actuality, what you withhold is just how much they're taking out. It's not the measure that matters. What measures it matters is how do we pay our taxes? When, how do we pay less legally? Like everything we're talking about taxes, like all legal. We're not talking about like, oh, I'm going to go to like, you know, some island somewhere and offshore the money and no, what I was amazed by when I did this tax section and the more I do on tax planning is how much you can legally do to change your taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, when we pay taxes, how we get taxed, how it fits. It's just one of those things. And the other thing I'm amazed by, but nobody is really is how much of the tax law is really not favorable for child free folks. You know, people see like the child tax credit, but there's other things that change and fit in there. So, all right, we're going to run through. There's actually 16 different sections in this, and we're going to see what happens. So let's start at the beginning. Talk to me about income tax law fundamentals. It simply says that taxes, income taxes, are a way to raise money for government operations. Love that, don't we? Yep. And the other one in here on income tax law as a U.S. citizen, you are taxed on your worldwide earnings. Does not matter where, does not matter how, does not, you know, you rob a bank, you are still owe income tax on it. Like just, it's kind of funny. Like right now in the U.S., we have a weird mix of whether or not pot's legal, you know, marijuana. Banks, you can't use banks for it, but IRS will tax you on your, your pot sales. Like it's just, mm -hmm. IRS does not care if it's legal, illegal, <laughs> where it comes from you still pay taxes on it. Yeah, we were having that discussion recently, like how are you gonna send a, just mail a big fat stack of cash in if you have a pot shop and <laughs> no taxes, because you can't have a bank account. Yeah, and it, it's really weird, because like IRS, like, I don't care. <laughs> like, uh, one of my colleagues, she uh, specialized in helping uh, sex workers and how do they manage their money and how do they do taxes? They're independent contractors and they, like, it's just like, IRS has a classification for that. And how do we do this? And like, cool. But like other areas, like, no, that's legal. And it really gets weird when you're talking to clients about like, well, I did X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, here's what IRS wants about that. And the rest is up to you and like whatever other things you got going on. All right. Income tax law. By the way, the other one, income tax law here is it changes every single freaking day, it seems like. Like there's actually updates every year on, will this change and this change and that change. 
for the CFP exam, they they tell you which set of laws we're following this week. Mm -hmm. uh, when I took mine, the laws they were actually following, yeah, there's a chart. The laws they were following had got they got changed the year before, and I'm like, so I had to learn one for clients and one for the test. And you're like, which lens are we looking through? Oh, it's crazy. That's the law. We're not going to go further into that. Section two is on gross income. So this is talking about the concepts of income. There are actually two concepts, an economic concept, which is what economists use, and that is changes in an individual's wealth. But that is not what the IRS cares about necessarily when like the accountants will use income, expenses, gains, and losses. So that is what you put on your tax return. And then you have above the line deductions, which reduces your adjusted gross income by gross income. And then you've got all your above the line deductions. So if you're putting money away for like education or paying education costs, health savings account, moving, self-employment, things there you can write off there above the line to reduce that adjusted gross income. And then you have below the line deductions as well, which are standard deductions or any itemized deductions. So if you're writing off medical expenses, mortgage interest, things like that, if you are itemizing your expenses, you either do standard deduction or itemized. Yeah, and this is actually crossing into the next section on income tax calculations, but I want to pause here for a second. So people talk about their gross income. One of the ones I'm seeing pretty frequently right now is if you are in an income-driven repayment program, like SAVE program for your student loans, your total gross income is what matters. Now, here's where it gets kind of interesting. If you take your 401k as a traditional, that lowers that income and it lowers the payment for SAVE. Cool. It may mean you're actually paying more tax in the future, but you lower your payment now and you're better off. And this is where it gets really screwy with taxes. Where like, There's not like a, you should do this every time. I had somebody in one of the uh, online groups ask, well, what's the best answer for which accounts to put in from Roth, traditional, whatever for child-free folks? And I'm like, it depends. It depends on the state. It depends on your situation. It depends on what's going on. But you can kind of mess with your gross income a little bit. The other one from gross income is the question of kind of like, when am I getting that tax? And we're going to go into that more in here. But this starts that discussion about like, well, billionaires don't get taxed the same way as regular folk. You're right. Because if you look at people running big companies, their income's like $100,000, but they made $40 million on that company this year. What's income versus capital gains and how it matters. And with our clients, it matters kind of like, how are we counting it? Do you have a business? How do we structure it? How are we doing your retirement savings? A lot of big things in there. We talked a little about, but number three is income tax calculations. I mean, you kind of just hit on it. A lot of it is gross income, but it's looking at form 1040, which is just your federal return. And this is, this is where we start getting into the math of it. As we start kind of pulling this apart, one of the things to think about, and this is kind of for everybody thinking about taxes, End of 2025, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act will sunset for, for personal. So what this means in English is Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which was, I don't know, eight and a half years ago now, almost nine, uh, made corporate tax, the personal, go back to where they were in at the end of 2025. That's where they doubled the standard deduction and other things. That's all changing in December unless the laws change again. So we're over here. We actually have, end of December 25. Yeah, December of 2025, the end of the year. So essentially it's for your 2026 taxes. And this is where like everything that changes. So like for example, for the last eight some odd years, most people have taken the standard deduction. They doubled the standard deduction, everybody's taken it. So we're not actually writing off things like mortgage interest. Well, at the end of 2025, when we get to 2026, that standard deduction drops back down, might change the rules again. And this is where like, I, I explain to clients, I'm like, okay, for the next two years, we're going to do this. For the year after that, I don't know. <laughs> and that's like, they're like, how could you not know? Well, it depends on which assumption we make. All right. Number four, tax characteristics of entities. Man, that sounds like a boring topic. It's actually a lot easier than it sounds. Uh, it's just businesses. So whether you're a sole proprietor, you and the business are one. Um, corporation, corporations are paying taxes, and then the owners of corporations are also paying taxes. So it's like double taxation. So people sometimes will not want to have a corporation because you're taxed twice. 
and then pass through. So like things as such as partnership, limited liability partnerships as corporations or limited liability companies where to the IRS, you are the same as your business. And so you're getting taxed Yeah, personal side and it's all one. It's not any different. So it's, I think this one's pretty straightforward and simple. It's, I don't know. It's kind of fun to me, I guess. I liked I like taxes. I like I like talking about saving taxes. <laughs> Bree's liking taxes and estate planning. Like, you know, the well, so here's the thing. A lot of our clients have businesses. And they'll say, Well, I took fifty thousand dollars out of the business that this year, but I'm getting taxed like I have a hundred thousand. Well, if you have like an LLC or partnership, if I keep the money in my business bank account, the IRS thinks you got it. You know, they they disregard the entity is technically a term. They're just like, yep, you're the same. Child Free Wealth is actually an LLC. So if Child Free Wealth has money in the bank at the end of the year, technically that's my money, even though I didn't take a paycheck on that. And that's where like people are like, wait, how are they taxing me on something I didn't take? And the IRS is like, no, you did. You just have it over here like in a checking account instead of a savings account. Like IRS sees things different. And then people go, well, then why do I bother doing an LLC? Well, you do the LLC because of the protection and, and the liability and other things. And because it's more tax effective in some cases. And then they go, well, can I do an escrow? Could it? There's a lot of funky things you can do to save money or whatever on taxes. Sometimes I'll tell clients, I'm like, yes, that'll save you a little bit of taxes, but it's not worth the work. And there's other times like, no, you must make this change. And, and that's where it gets weird. Uh, when you're talking about running your own small business, it, it's just, it's one of those areas where like, I'll reach out to somebody CPA and like, so I ran the numbers this way and I ran it this way. And what do we think? And like, there's not a clear answer sometimes. All right. Number five is basis. What the heck is basis? Basis is going to be the cost that you acquired something for. So if you're buying a home and you spend $500,000 on your home, your basis is $500,000. So we're talking in here about gain or loss. So let's say I buy a house, I spend $500,000 on the house, and then in 10 years I go to sell it and it's now $900,000. I have a gain of $400,000. But if I buy the house, something happens, and now the house is worth less, I'm losing its the same with, we'll do this with like index funds or single stocks, any sort of investment for clients as well, is we'll talk about your gain or loss over the year. It's just how much you acquired that property for or that investment for what you paid when you purchased it. That is the basis. And there's all different types of basis depending on the situation which you're talking about. There's original basis, there's adjusted basis, carry um it's the carryover basis. So if you're getting a gift of something, there's step up in basis. If you, let's say, this is one we see a lot of clients is they have received an inheritance. We'll often ask, we need to figure out what that step up in basis was. So what is that fair market value of that inheritance on the day the person that gifted it to you passed? And that is saying, let's example, grandma buys a house for $10,000. 40 years ago, she dies, she gives you that house today, and now that is worth $100,000. Your basis when you go to sell that is $100,000. So now you're paying taxes, if there's any, on the gain of $100,000. But if you're getting it on a Tuesday for $100,000 and you're selling it on a Wednesday for $100,000, you're going to pay $0 in taxes. Yeah, and interestingly enough, understanding basis starts changing how I do financial planning for child-free folks. So a great example of this, when you're talking about rental properties, you talk about the adjusted basis. Over time, we depreciate it, and we're going to get back into cost recovery and other things. But one of the reasons why owning real estate works for folks is because they're passing on to the next generation. They'll get that step up in basis we just talked about. Well, if you're not going to pass it on to the next generation, some of the math around owning real estate or rentals really just does not work anymore. And this is where people are like, wait, wait, wait. I, I've been told we always have to own real estate. And yes, because of this step up in basis part of it. 
And this is also part of those where, you know, it's a question of how do I pass on money to the next generation? Like how do billionaires pass on money? Part of it's a step up in basis. And that's where we're not doing that. And it's going to change some of the planning. And the systems have it built in. They'll say, oh, you should do this because you'll get a step up in basis. I'm like, not going to happen. I'm spending that money. And it starts messing with it. All right. Section six, cost recovery concepts. This is talking about depreciation and how those costs are going to be recovered. So we just mentioned basis and adjusted basis for rental properties. Oftentimes people will go ahead and depreciate that. So decrease the value of whatever purchase or whatever property they purchased in the event that you sell it in a way that the IRS doesn't like, you have to recover that cost and then pay taxes on that. So there are certain instances where you will have to recover that depreciation cost and pay ordinary income taxes on that depreciation. And then anything above that is subject to capital gains taxes instead. It is just saying how that how the depreciation is going to be recovered and how that's going to be taxed. Sometimes, like this is what I say to clients, like before you make a giant move, just check with me. Because like sometimes I'm like, hold up. Like if you waited one day or did it this way, this like small changes completely change the the laws. Um, and, And this is where like how it gets accounted, where it goes, like a really small mistake can cost you. That's the hard part. Seven, tax consequences on the sale of assets. So this is going to be long-term capital gains, short-term capital gains, or losses. Um, If you want to know what short-term is, it is if anything you have acquired and sold within less than a year. And so that is people who, like Robinhood, they like to take and buy and sell stocks you're going to pay a short-term capital gains tax, which is higher. If you have those assets for over a year, long-term capital gains, then you pay a lower tax rate on there. We were talking earlier about business owners and billionaires. Oftentimes they will make money on their companies because they have stock in there. If they've had that stock for years and sell it, they're getting taxed at a lower rate than income taxes and the short-term capital gains because long-term capital gains is the most tax-friendly of the tax rates. Same thing as there's section 121 is going to be a sale of personal residence. So when you're buying or selling a home, if you are single, you can say you can avoid paying taxes on up to $250,000 of gain on a property. And if you are married filing jointly, you can avoid paying taxes on up to $500,000 of gain in a property as well. Um, And then it also talks a little bit about the depreciation recapture, that ordinary income that I talked about earlier, and the capital gains. So it's really just breaking down every sort of scenario and talking about how that's going to be taxed. Yeah, literally, I've worked with clients where, like, if they waited a couple more days because it's year and one day for long-term capital gains, they'll pay 15% tax. But if they sell it, like, two days before that, it's now income tax, and it's 40%. I mean, we're talking about huge differences in days. I had somebody that actually went to sell their house and like we did the math and she was off by two days. And I'm like, oh. like, you know, because uh, it was a gain over the 250. Now, one other one while we're here in this tax consequences, part, one of the ones I point out here is the Robin Hood and the day trading. You can actually get into things called wash sales where we sell something and lost and rebuy it and we, it messes things up. You can, you can end up owing more taxes than you made on the property. And this is one of those specific ones that, to wash sales and stocks. I had somebody who was doing a lot of day trading back and forth, got a report, actually was from Robin Hood, and they owed over $2 million in taxes on the $200,000 in gain they had. And it was all because of wash sales and other things. I mean, like, be careful. All right, number eight, like-kind exchanges and involuntary conversions. Yeah, so this is the like-kind exchange is going to be section 1031 relating to rental properties and what people will do is they will purchase a rental property. They will use that money, get some equity. They oftentimes they're leveraging it. And then down the road, they will take, sell that first rental property and then purchase a rental property with a higher price point. And they're essentially stepping up and 
growing to bigger and bigger properties. And they'll keep doing this over and over and over again to avoid paying taxes on that gain. Because if you take that money and use it to purchase a new rental property within, you have to identify it within 45 days and then you have to take possession of it within 180 days, then you don't have to pay the taxes on that gain. And you keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And oftentimes people with kids will do this because if they keep doing it, there's some former presidents that have done this as well. They keep doing this over and over. And then when they die, their kids actually get a step up and basis on all that property. It's a legal loophole to avoid paying taxes on gains of properties. Yeah, ever. Ever. You're not paying taxes ever on that in that case. Yeah. That's part of what's built into real estate and owning it, which why for child-free folks, 1031 exchanges almost never make sense. I, I've done these with folks. I'm like, well, at some point you're going to want to cash this out and you're just kicking can down the road. And essentially you end up with this tax debt. It's not, you don't literally own a debt, but like I have not paid on the capital gains on this. And, and it's now hundreds of thousands, it becomes millions. And now I owe capital gains and now I'm at the higher rate. And you know, there, there's kind of a, a balance to it. But what will happen is part of the reason why real estate looks so good is because you can just like never pay taxes on it if you do it right, if you're passing the next generation. That doesn't hit us. It can work if you have children and you're doing all those steps, but it's not going to work for child free. Number nine, income taxation of trusts and estates. Yeah, so trusts are going to be, so trust is just a legal entity um, and saying how it's taking the possession away from people sometimes. You'll often hear like trust, wills, all those things, just saying that we're going to put the trust in control of property or assets, anything like that. They're taxed at a higher rate and then estate tax. When somebody passes, they do have to pay estate tax if they're above the federal estate tax exemption, which in 2024 is $13.61 million per person. So if you have assets over that, then you're going to be taxed at a different uh, rate for anything above that number. And the highest percentage can be up to 37%. So it's pretty pretty hefty. With the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act we were talking about earlier, we are often working with clients who are expecting to inherit money and trying to set everything up in a way that helps avoid some of those state taxes later. It's all legal, but you have to just do it in a efficient and timely manner. Yeah. And this is one of those, because it's falling back in 2025, people go, well, there's no way my parents are going to have over 13.6 million. Well, here's the thing. If they have 5 million now and they live 10 years, well, it'll probably double at least, I got 10 million. If they have another 10 years, it'll probably double again. If it's 20 million, yeah, they're over it. And there's some moves you could make now that make a big impact. You know, we've done a couple of analyses for folks and depending on the moves, I mean, you could be saving yourselves millions and millions of dollars on taxes on there. Um, it's, it's a big issue right now. Number 10, passive activity. This is just talking about are things really, really passive? Um, so anything like rental or trade business that you don't participate in, it's talking about whether or not your participation is required in the business and passive income is one of the categories that the IRS recognizes, it's saying how how that's determined. Yeah, it's a question of do you have risk in it or not? There's a few other fun things. Not really a big deal for most people. Number 11, charitable contributions and deductions. Yeah, this one is talking about how much you can write off when it comes to your charitable contributions. If you're giving cash to a public or public charity, then it's going to be 60% of your AGI. There are some rules on how much you can take within one year and what you're donating. It really is dependent on what exactly you're giving. So best to talk to a professional for that because there are so many nuances there. What percentage you can write off, uh, how much you can write off, when you can write it off, and what type of property you're giving, all those things. Yeah, and this is one of those that I point out for our child-free folks. If you're going to give to a charity, if you give it to them in your estate, you get nothing. Like they just get the money, you get no tax break. If you give them to them during life, you can get a tax break, maybe depending on what you give and how. If you're going to give charitably, I want a tax break if I can get it. So I want to give it now during my life. There are actually some fancy ways, and it's worth it, where you can like 
I'm going to give it to the charity now in a trust. And then they get, you know, they get it when I die, but I get to get the tax credit today. And it's kind of like a weird thing, but it works. And then you can still get the income off it or different things. But what happens is the timing of your charitable deductions matters and how you give it. And like, so there's also like, you can give appreciated stock and there's different ways. There's a lot of good financial and tax planning opportunities around charitable. Number 12, tax implications of changing circumstances. This is marriage, divorce, or death. So if you're getting married, you can file married filing jointly, provided you are married by the end of the year. Little personal pro tip on that is if you and your partner or future spouse have very different incomes and you're not joining finances till you get married, get married in the first half of the year. So that way you're not paying more taxes for money that you didn't get to touch. That is what I did. I got married in January because I was not going to mess with my tax rate from getting married at the end of the year. And then divorce talks about when you can change your, how, how you file taxes depending on your divorce. And then also death, you can do married filing jointly in the event that you are married in the, you're continuing to marry the, the surviving spouse can do married filing jointly for that year in which their spouse dies. And then there's also things like surviving spouse. If you have dependents, you can file for a couple of years after that as well just different tax rates. Yeah. And there's also head of household, which we're really very rarely going to run into because you'd have to have a dependent. And there's also like, should I find mail or I separate all that? There's some weird things that happen in here. I had somebody this weekend ask me, well, is it better financially to get married? You know, they're child free. They've been together for like forever. And what do we do? And I'm like, well, do you need health insurance? I go, no, and probably not. <laughs> like, I mean, like health insurance, is like one of the big ones when it comes to taxes, uh, there's both a marriage penalty and a, and a potential you can save money uh, as a married couple, but it depends on like, are our incomes the same? Are they big difference? Are we going to have to the point where I'm like, don't get married for the tax purposes. The one thing that does change is there's limits on how much you can gift to each other if you're not married. So that is one of those like kind of weird things in there. All right. Number 13, tax accounting methods. This is going to be how businesses file their taxes. So there are different options. There is cash, which means that you are paying taxes and you're doing all your accounting based off of when the money actually hits your account and you have it in the bank. There's a cruel. So that is going to be when you earn it, all of the income, you have to pay a tax on it. So you could, some businesses could earn income in November, but not actually get the money until January or February but you still have to pay taxes on it for that previous year. And then there's hybrid, which is when you're combining the two. And I think that is a really big headache to deal with because you have to be very careful on keeping track of all that. I think cash accounting is personally the easiest. Well, here's the way I look at it. It says tax accounting. I need an accountant to help me with how to figure out the right way to do that from the business. Number 14, tax compliance. This is just when do you have to file your taxes by? April 15th, unless you're going to file for an extension, then you have six months, an extra six months to do that. But extensions does not mean that you have more time to pay. You still have to pay everything by April 15th. You can just wait to file till later. Yep. And every once in a while, they'll be like, oh, you had a natural, natural disaster. They'll kick your data away or something like that. But you need to know when you have to pay taxes by seriously. Uh, number 15, alternative minimum tax, AMT. This one is just, um, it, it's going to be like if you have any ISOs or other forms of compensation, whatever they call it, special tax preferences. And if you're just simple salary and don't have any options, probably not going to run into this. It's if you have a little bit more complicated of a situation, you're doing two different tax calculations. You're doing the regular one, and then you're also doing the AMT calculation, and you have to pay the greater of the two. Yeah, AMT used to be a way to make sure that people that made a lot of money paid a minimum amount of tax. The laws got changed, and now really the only time we see it is with stock options or ISOs, instead of stock options. But that's going to change a little bit also, possibly at the end of 2025. So keep your eye out. And number 16, last but not least, tax management techniques. 
that was recapping everything in this course and just saying, hey, if you want to save on taxes, make sure you're doing tax planning. Yeah. You want to know, am I paying income taxes, capital gains? When am I paying it? How am I paying it? Like, am I doing it time? Do I have, it's a giant thing. So the way I look at it is investing is really simple. Taxes are very complex. Taxes are where you want a professional. You with me on that, Bray? Absolutely. I love a CPA, a really good CPA who can help with taxes. Yeah. CPAs often will help with your tax filing. May not do long-term tax planning because they're trying to make the goal, how do I pay less money this year? Whereas financial planners, we're trying to make sure you're paying less money over your entire lifetime. There are some times with a CPA, I'll argue, I'm like, yes, I know that's the right answer this year. It's the wrong answer long-term. Uh, where if you're optimizing to pay the least taxes this year, you may end up paying more in the future. Got to find a balance between it. So that's the tax section. I'm not going to ask you how you rated it because it sounded like you loved it. But, uh, you know. Yeah, it was, it was a good time. I, when I was reading this stuff, I was like, all right, this like it reads like stereo instructions, which now ages me. But like, you know, like, like I'm reading this like this makes no sense. But what happens is once you work with a whole bunch of clients, it all makes sense. But you need to like see like hundreds and thousands of returns to go. Oh, that's what's going on. You know, we actually have a software that we use with our clients that does an entire tax planning uh, assessment. It looks at, okay, based on the state you're in and this is where you're going, this is what we recommend, these are different things. We can do scenarios. I break out the software to do this. Like I'm, you know, the software is telling me, okay, here's opportunities. Because sometimes I'm like, where did the law change? Wait, you got this in this state and this does that. It gets super confusing, but all important stuff to know. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a rating or review. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Follow Child Free Wealth on social media or email us at podcast at childfreewealth.com. If you're interested in working together, learn more by visiting our website, www.childfreewealth.com. We'll see you next time.